recording? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Darren Ambat. I'm a current master's student at San Diego State University, and I'm also a Wrigley Fellow this summer. So today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the effects of ocean acidification on blue banded goby reproductive output and behavior. Um, but first, I'd like to give you guys a pretty brief background about what ocean acidification is and my study species specifically. And then I'll jump into uh, what we are researching, how we research it, and why we are researching it. So as most of us know, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide, or CO2, is increasing in the atmosphere, mainly due to uh, the production of greenhouse gases. Um, and this increases the CO2 concentration in the seawater. Um, and with that, uh, there comes a decrease in the seawater pH. And the current projections um, set, show that the seawater pH is gonna decrease by about 0.2 to 0.4 pH units by the end of the century. So that's pretty quick and it's a pretty drastic change. Um, it's, there's also a lot of past research on calcifying organisms from cnidarians such as corals or this beautifully drawn abalone by my friend at San Diego State. Um, as shown in this example, there's a ton of OA papers that have been published from the years um, 2000 to 2013, looking at all of these publications for these organisms. But what about the fish? There's not that many publications relative to the other more popular coral and mollusks. Um, not a lot of work has been done on fish. Even though fish have been shown that they can regulate um, the, uh, the impacts of ocean acidification, through their acid-base uh, reactions, nothing, evil, even fewer studies have been done on fish reproduction specifically. So enter my study species, the blue banded goby. Um, the scientific name is Lithrypnus dolly. They're very abundant. They range from Morro Bay, California, all the way down to the, uh, all the way down to Mexico. They're especially super abundant here on Catalina, which is why I've chosen this as my uh, study location. Um, but they're a relatively small fish, just ranging from about 18 to 45 millimeters if you get lucky and get catch a really big one. Um, but they re reproduce uh, repeatedly over their breeding season, which is anywhere from April into September. So it's a perfect time window of this fellowship of being able to get these gobies when they're ready to make babies. Um, and they are reach maturity really fast. So they can reach maturity in just under a month or just about at a month. So it's really quick and they're just ready to you know, reproduce, which makes it good, easy uh, species to studies for me. Um, a lot of studies have looked at uh, how their reproduction is affected by predator risk or anything from intra-specific social interactions, but no studies have actually looked at how the reproduction of blue banded gobies is affected by ocean acidification. So that leads me to my two research questions. The first being, does lowered seawater pH affect blue banded goby reproductive output and behavior? And I also am hoping to answer, can the lab mesocosms be methods be repeated in a field setting? So, and kind of as a sub question, um, are the field results consistent? If we're able to do the field methods, are they the results consistent with the lab results? So, how are we doing this? Well, we start off, we have to collect the fish. So we collect about 40 to 60 blue banded gobies from Isthmus Reef, which is just outside of Big Fisherman's Cove, so it's super easy to access. We bring these fish quickly back to the lab after a short boat ride. We quickly uh, sedate them using MS-222, and then we sex, size, and tag each fish. That way we can see um, easily be in the tanks, what sex they are, and we can see their growth over, to, over the week trials that we have as well. Um, so we do all of that stuff, kind of stress them out, but then we let them acclimate and de-stress for about a day. This day is used because it gives them enough time to kind of recuperate from being sedated, but it also doesn't allow them to start, you know, developing their little um, social dynamics, and it really doesn't let them uh, reproduce before we want them to reproduce in our actual treatments. So to answer question one, we uh, kind of construct these artificial reefs in the lab tanks. These artificial reefs consist of one dominant male with four females. So this one dominant male can establish his harem and he could potentially uh, reproduce with all four of these females. <laughs> You'd be a, a lucky guy, some would think. Um, and also in these artificial reefs, we put uh, PVC tubes, which are called tunnels of love, attached to rocks. 
Um, and we provide all of the Gobi tanks with this same kind of habitat structure so it can encourage reproduction um, and give them all the same amount of nesting sites. Um, once we make those artificial reefs, we put them in these tanks that you see an example of on the right hand picture right here. And what we do is we have a control tanks which just remain at those ambient kind of seawater levels. Uh, the pH is about, you know, 8, 8.03. And, and then we also have the OA treatments. Um, and we decrease the pH in those treatments by about 0 0.2 pH units, which we just saw is like the projected future OA conditions. And we hold the fish in these tanks for a week, uh, week long trials. During those trials, if we, we check the nests inside those PVC tubes, the tunnels of love, we check them daily. And if we find any eggs, like you see in this example, we're able to take an underwater photograph of these uh, egg, we call them egg clutches. So it's like in one nest. And then we're able to quantify the number, the total number of eggs. So we can compare control treatments versus those uh, OA treatment tanks that we have. We also collect data on the number of clutches. So that's like the number of egg kind of groups laid um, in each nest. We also look at egg size, egg fertilization rate, um, and not pictured here, but we also I also do daily GoPro videos. So we're able to go back and look uh, to see if any of those gobies in the treatments are you know, experiencing slightly different behavioral uh, traits. So this is a picture of us counting them, kind of takes a long time, but it's, you know, it's kind of mindless work, just put on a podcast, go ahead and click away and count all the eggs. Um, and to answer question number two, can mesocausal methods be repeated in a field setting? We're using uh, what we call, what my lab calls collapsible benthic isolation tents, also known as CBITs, but I'm just gonna refer to them as chambers because that's too much of a mouthful to always say. So I'm just gonna call them chambers, uh, but we use these benthic chambers and we put them out on the ocean floor in Big Fisherman's Cove. Um, they have these kind of clear polycarbonate walls like you can see in this picture on the right. So they remain, they allow for those hydrodynamics or the wave motion to kind of push and you know, circulate that water through these tanks or through these chambers, but they're still, our lab has verified that they isolate that fixed volume of water. So whatever water's in there is theoretically supposed to be staying in there. So that allows us to then acidify those chambers with this, with a 500 mil plastic syringe. Um, and we have super saturated uh, seawater, we saturate it with CO2 and inject that into the chamber with, it seems like the world's biggest syringe ever. If you guys ever wanna come see them, let me know. Um, but then we acidify the chambers just like we do for the lab. But it's really cool and important to use these chambers because these chambers, um, provide those go the gobies in these little artificial reefs with more cues that we see actually in the environment. Like in this picture example, um, we see a kelp bass, one of the predators of blue banded gobies, circling around lurk lurking for its next meal. Um, so we put these artificial reefs in there and we same thing, we let these trials run for a week and we check the tunnels of love every day to see if there's any eggs uh, laid in those nests. So why is this research important? Well, even though um, blue banded gobies are not a big, you know, kind of well-known species of fish, it's very easy to manipulate and capture these gobies. They're pretty hardy and they're just ready to lay their eggs in these nests, which makes it super easy and reliable to use them um, as kind of a model species for other fish, such as the California sheephead. Um, in that top right picture, which is a very economically and ecologically important fish species. And fun fact, the California sheephead also changes sex, just like the goby. So there might be life history similarities between these two species that would be interesting to know their reproduction. Um, using these chambers in the field um, increases the ecological realism. So that means that it's incorporating more of those environmental factors that are more realistic in the field that we don't really find in the lab because the lab's kind of like that artificial uh, situation that you're never gonna find a goby just casually having babies in the lab in, unless a researcher like me comes along and manipulates them. Um, but those chambers also help us to better study the OA effects on near shore organisms because those chambers also allow for that, you know, daily fluctuation and that variability, not only in seawater conditions, but in light conditions, predator conditions, 
and anything else that you can think of that you can find in the ocean and not in the lab. So we're still trying to iron out these, the second part of this research project with the uh, benthic chambers, but uh, we're continuously improving them. So hopefully we're gonna be able to implement laboratory mesocosms into the field for future research, um, therefore increasing this, again, this ecological realism. So with that, um, I have my contact in that bottom left for anyone that has more questions. I know it's a pretty quick presentation, but I'm more than happy to answer any further questions you guys might have. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for being here and thank USC Wrigley for allowing me to be a fellow and present to you guys today.